Welcome everyone to my presentation discussion on how you can develop a student mindset to help propel your life into becoming a penetration tester. My name is John Helmus and I'm currently a penetration tester for Nordstrom headquarters based out of Seattle, Washington, as well as a adjunct professor for the City University of Seattle um, based out of Seattle, Washington. I uh, teach cybersecurity courses there as well. Um, so the, the, today's talk is going to discuss about how I got to that portion of my career and how I can uh, basically use that framework and help out the masses to allow you to use this framework to apply it to yourself and help get you into a career in pen testing. So with that being said, let's go ahead and get started. So. This is the agenda for today's talk. We're going to have a quick introduction about myself. It's going to list out just some of my background and discuss of how I got into pen testing. Then we're gonna have a general overview of, in my own words, what pen testing really is. We're gonna talk about how you can develop the student mindset and what that really means. And it's not you know, a traditional academic student mindset. Um, and then we're going to look at some roadmaps about you know, ways of how you can get into pen testing um, and what type of jobs you can look at that will help carve out a path for you to get into pen testing, as well as some different um, jobs titles that may or may not have pen testing as part of that job title. We'll also talk about some speed bumps that you can fully expect while you're trying to get into pen testing or even cybersecurity in general and talk about how we can work around some of those speed bumps. We're also going to talk about some of the educational things that you might see um, you know, for pen testing jobs, the requirements such as a bachelor's, a master's degree, some jobs even um, you know, ask that you have a PhD. And then we're going to talk about certifications, talk about the cost for certifications and just the amount of time that you're going to need for each certification. So you, we can break it down about how much money it's going to cost per month if that's a certification that you would be interested in. And then we're going to talk about how, you know, once you try or once you become a pen tester, how we can maintain that student mindset and how we can maintain the motivation to keep learning and to keep um, teaching, right? Because as cybersecurity professionals, where our job is to help others, right? And in pen testing, it's a very small community and we really rely on each other to help each other learn and to grow. And then to finish up the talk today, we're gonna talk about just some, some issues that we're seeing in the cybersecurity field um, in the COVID era. And what I mean by that is, we're going to look at some of the speed bumps of what I see happening in the world as it pertains to getting into pen testing. So we're going to talk about how you can kind of maneuver around some of those COVID issues. So to start off, let's talk about myself. My name is John Helmus. As I said, I'm a penetration tester for Nordstrom headquarters based out of Seattle, Washington. I also am an adjunct professor. However, I didn't always used to be that. I actually started out as a naval engineer. Um, I was in the U.S. Navy for four years, and I didn't do anything really tech-related. I uh, was a small boat guy. I worked on small boats, um, worked on the mechanics for them and everything, and did sm small boat operations. Once I got out of the Navy, I decided that um, after a couple different career moves that I was going to go into tech. So I decided to get a bachelor's degree in information technology. And while doing that, I got a job as a help desk specialist. I moved up vertically within the company that I started out as a help desk specialist for and became a firewall guy, did a lot of networking. And then while I was pursuing my master's degree, I wound up becoming a cybersecurity engineer um, for a DOD contract. And then from there, I became an ISSC for a bigger DOD contract and a much, much larger network. Um, and then once I got the ISSC job, I actually was finishing up or had just finished my master's degree and wound up becoming a teacher at a small university based out of San Diego where I was living at the time. Um, and then from there, I was there for about eight months as the ISSC, and then I pivoted into 
uh, red teaming for the DOD, and I did that for about eight months as well. And then from there on, I went and became a pen tester for Nordstrom, and I've been up in Seattle ever since. Um, so as you can see, I didn't have, you know, a very technical background. Um, however, during that time, which was the span over about four years, um, I was continuously going to school. I was getting one to two or three certs every year, if you averaged it out. Um, and I just kept growing and I kept learning. And I was fortunate enough that while I was in the help desk role and getting my bachelor's degree, um, I was introduced to Kali Linux and also learned that, you know, Kali Linux was a very popular operating system used by penetration testers. Then learned what pen testing was and was just completely engaged in that topic and have been ever since. And we're going to talk a lot about that, about how you know, you can use an untraditional path and just use passion towards getting towards pen testing to get into pen testing. Um, some other things that I've done as well uh, along my, my journey is I've been a content writer for CompTIA. Um, if you've taken any test questions through uh, CertMaster for the Network Plus exam or for the Pen Test Plus exam, then there's a good chance that you might have had a question that I wrote. Um, I also currently write content for Medium. I have my own blog that I maintain through there. I've been a technical project manager for various different projects um, throughout my career. Uh, I also do um, bug bounty when I have time. Um, I go. I have an account on HackerOne and Bug Crowd. Um, I also do my own research for uh, AWS. I'm actually currently working with a large publisher to put out a book based around that topic towards the end of this year. And as it says down there, I'm a pending author. So as you can see, I started out in a not very technical position. However, I was fortunate enough to realize early on um, in my academic journey and in my tech journey that I really liked pen testing. And I took that and harnessed that energy to push myself forward and turn that energy into a passion. And that's what this discussion and this talk is going to be about, is how we can turn that that idea and that want into a passion and how to really roadmap that passion. So, but before we do that, let's go ahead and talk about exactly, you know, what pen testing is. So penetration testing, which is also known as pen testing or pen test or ethical hacking, right? It's an authorized simulated attack on a client organization. This organization has signed you on and says, hey, we need you to evaluate our company by actually discovering and exploiting vulnerabilities. So what does that really mean? Well, it's more than just hacking things, right? It's a business. It's a business approach. So I wrote this quick little analogy example, right? Where pen testing is like you're trying to find something, right? And you know what you may or you may or may not know what you're trying to find, but you're trying to find something, right? So we'll say something is X and that's the scope, right? And then the scope of pen testing, scope is what you're allowed to ethically hack. So X can be whatever, right? And we are trying to get to X. And then we get to X, right? We finally, and in a pen test, let's say X was a target system, we, we get onto the target system. And now we find out more about that target system, right? And this target system is X. We find out more about that target system and more about the environment that it's in. And we find other machines and targets and hosts and all sorts of things, right, that are associated with X. So we have Y and Z. And we start moving to Y and Z and starting finding out more about Y and Z and the environments that Y and Z are in, right? We like to think of that as like lateral movement, right? Because that's a big portion of pen testing is once you get on, once you actually get onto a machine that you've done your research, discovery, enumeration, and then you get persistent access, we find out more about X and the surrounding components of X. So when you get to Y and Z, that's lateral movement. And that's a key thing that I want you to remember because on this next slide here, it says, imagine you have to write out a comprehensive report that details every step that you made before going to X, during getting on the, on X, right? And X is a system and then after. And right, and we use the, the term web search here um, because in the previous uh, slide, it, it mentioned web search as an example. Um, so now you have to illustrate the why and the what and the impact of everything that you did, right? You have to just, and then you have to give um, an illustration of how to, to fix it and how, how we can do a better job next time. And we, meaning the pen testing company, which would be you and the client organization, right? So that's pen testing. 
pen testing is a lot of research. It's a lot, a lot of discovery and a little bit of technical capabilities. So uh, this is straight from a, a blog of mine. It's uh, the reality of pen testing, right? I think, I always think that, um, you know, from the outside looking in, a lot of times individuals might think that pen testing is this, you know, capture the flag kind of exercise when it's anything but that. It's really a advanced business process, in my opinion. So here it says, the reality of pen test is banging your head against a wall and looking at systems that are typically locked down fairly well. Shout out to all this, the uh, big companies and small companies and medium companies out there that are locking down their systems and you know, making pen testers jobs uh, a nightmare at times. Um, you know, that's, that's really what it is. You're, you're looking for issues in systems that are probably not there. However, you as the pen tester need to, to verify that. And when, you know, we think about verification, we think about quality assurance, we think about quality checks, right? We're doing a quality check for a system. That's essentially what pen testing is. We are highly technical quality assurance people. That's essentially what we're doing. And I'm not downplaying pen testing. Please don't let that steer you away because as we're going to see throughout this entire discussion, it's a very, very interesting field to be in. However, <clears throat> to note, penetration testing is probably 70% report writing and research and only actually 30% hands-on. So, you know, if only being in a technical aspect is, is what, you know, engages you, then this might not be the field for you. However, you know, let's keep looking and, you know, perhaps throughout this roadmap, you'll see something that piques your interest um, because there's a lot of different things that you can do that involve pen testing that just isn't part of the pen testing job title. So why do we pen test, right? Well, we have this white hat, gray hat, and black hat. The white hat guy is the good guy. That's the penetration testers. Those are the guys that are out there getting paid um, to authorize, or I'm sorry, getting paid to hack a system with authorization um, and provide a report that shows the landscape of of the client, right? And shows the threat landscape that shows all the issues and parts that can be exploited and things like that. The gray hat, I always like to say, is the individual who is in between the white hat and the black hat. That's the guy who, you know, might it might hack the system and, and patch it and then tell you, or they might hack the system and tell you, even though they weren't authorized, um, you know, you see a lot of different gray hats out there. Um, the best way I always like to say it is that the gray hat is the individual who would hack your system to feed their family if they needed to. Um, you know, it's that kind of like moral conflict kind of thing. So there's a lot of different ways of how a gray hat can, you know, uh, can hack a system and what and exactly what that entails. So, you know, please go out and research different uh, gray hat areas. However, the black hat is a very definitive answer where they are the malicious cyber criminals that keep the white hat employed, so to speak. And then the other big reason for pen testing is because we need to pen test for compliance, right? That's why we got a pen test because organizations have to meet a bare minimum in order to operate, right? And if they can't operate, well, then they can't generate revenue and money and stuff like that. So we have to pen test so that they can make money. So when, if for those of you that get into compliance-based pen testing, a lot of times you'll hear like, hey, we just need you to do this and this and this so that we can pass our compliance checks. And that happens a lot. And there's nothing wrong with that. However, do know that just because something is compliant, it doesn't mean it's secure. It just means it's at the most secure level that it has to be to operate. So I'm going to move my face window here just a little bit. I'm going to move that around for the rest of the uh, presentation just so that it doesn't take up important parts of the slides. So now let's look. Becoming a penetration tester, right? All right. So. These are some of the topics that we're going to talk about, right? We already mentioned that at the beginning a little bit. So we're going to talk about the mindset, being curious, expanding your network, and how we can just maintain our skill sets and then eventually give back. Because again, like I said, this is a small field and it's a, almost kind of like a almost everyone knows everyone sort of kind of vibe. Um, 
so it's really really crucial that you understand that it's a community where we all like to help each other so the student mindset what does that mean it doesn't necessarily mean you need to go into academia and constantly be getting degrees and things like that what that means is that you need to develop a framework in your head where you're constantly eager to learn right and you're continuously setting goals that you want to achieve you're setting milestones right you know where you want to be so you have to make a roadmap to get there so how do we do that well we have to stay out of our comfort zone and we have to understand that that's that's what it's going to be and that's how it's going to be and the other thing is is that we have to have people help us get there right we have to be humble to do that and we have to find mentors that will ensure that we are doing what we need to do to get where we want to go and the other big thing and i always like to say this is that when we're on our journeys into becoming pen testers and when we're on our journeys to be better pen testers don't ever try to seek validation you know this isn't about getting recognition for having you know the most certs or the most degrees or the most cves or the most exploits and and things like that it's about helping out everyone right and that's why i say not seeking validation but seeking education right you're you are out there seeking to help and educate others while also educating yourself and the biggest thing too here is this last point here where it says leave fear in the rear view mirror what that means is there are going to be plenty of times in your journey and in your career where you're going to be afraid of something right or it's going to startle you and it might draw you back a little bit don't do that because otherwise that's pushing you back into your comfort zone and if you don't stay out of your comfort zone you're not going to be able to grow so you really have to look at fear and just move past it so let me move my window a little bit we have to be curious penetration testers have to be curious they have to be eager to want to learn and understand how things work right you also have to be creative that's a big big fun portion of this this uh, career field in my opinion is that we get to be creative right um, we get to tinker around and, and look at things from a from a different angle and we get to like write up things that might not be so traditional um and there's just there's so many ways of how you can be creative in this field um but the other thing is too and it falls in with the uh, being being humble and also you know seeking to learn and leaving fear behind is that you have to be willing to dive into anything and be hungry to learn new things right and as it says down here being a pen tester is about being a jack of all trades but a master of none and what i mean by that is that a pen tester has to again be a tinkerer and want to do a little bit of everything however you're not going to be a master of of anything you might have a specialty where you focus on a particular particular topic however that doesn't mean um, that you're going to master it because as we have seen technology is continuously evolving and continuously changing so if you master something one day it might change the next day and let me change this slide so what's the next portion growing your network this is a big big thing that i feel is not talked about a lot right it's this is one of the things that's going to really help push your career field forward it's what helped push mine forward um this i essentially got into cybersecurity because i had um, a, a couple certifications and i had a degree however i didn't know a lot of individuals in cybersecurity that could help me in and eventually i met someone who was an isso and uh basically hired me on to be part of their dod contract as a cybersecurity engineer so with that being said that was a big big help to get me into cybersecurity um so from there you know obviously my my career pushed forward so you know growing your network is a big portion so where can you go to grow your network well for those of you in school 
you know, there's a lot of times, you know, your professors, they may actually be engineers that are working in the field. Make sure that you, you network with them. Your, your, your fellow students, right? They may actually be already in the field. There's a lot of uh, degree programs at, you know, night schools and adult educational schools where a lot of the individuals are already in the field. They're just getting a degree so to help push their career forward. LinkedIn is another great resource. Um, you can build a network on LinkedIn incredibly fast. Um, and especially now, and we'll talk about it later, but during the COVID era, LinkedIn has been, you know, a godsend, so to speak, to help others get into cybersecurity or at least find some kind of, you know, position in tech. Um, Twitter is another good one. Even Facebook, you know. You never know, you may have a, a friend from five years ago that may be in cybersecurity now that may be able to help you find a position that you're looking for. Um, mentors, right? And mentees, you may be having, you may actually have someone that you are helping out that's already in cyber and they just look up to you and they may able, or they may be able to find someone to help push you into a position that you wanna be in, you know, that will get you into pen testing. Um, and then obviously, you know, mentors, you want your mentors to be someone who is in the field, right? And that someone can help you get into the field. Um, conventions such as the ones now, right? During the COVID era, all this stuff is online and we're able to network fairly easily, right? And a lot of these conventions are all free. They're all online. It makes it pretty um, streamlined to, to network. Right. And then the other big things are like internships. I know with COVID internships were canceled for a lot of companies and it did affect a lot of people. Um, however, when internships become a thing again, it's going to be a really great way for you to get your foot in the door somewhere. And then, of course, on the job training. Right. Any place that is offering on the job training, rather it's cheap labor or if it's free, if it's going to help you get to where you want to go, then you need to take it. And that plays in part of being humble, is that understanding that you may not jump right into pen testing. You, you may have to start somewhere else. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that because it's all about the journey. Now, we've talked about our network. So now let's talk about how we can grow some of our technical skills, right? Because that is, you know, while it may not be the huge portion of pen testing, it is a big portion, right? And we we need to make sure that we can illustrate our technical skills so how do we go about that right especially when we're, we're the outside looking in right so i have listed here some ways of how we can um test our technical skills so try hack me hack the box and vuln hub these are areas where you can uh you know access vulnerable machines to test your technical skills and to actually evaluate yourself, as well as read write-ups on older machines that are provided on these uh, on these websites that allow you to learn how other people were actually hacking the machines and it helps you develop a methodology in your head. Um, and then another good way is just reading books, right? Going on Amazon and buying buying a book every so often or going into your local bookstore, um, whichever way is most comfortable for you, right? Just buy any book. And I, I can't I can't recommend enough books. Just, you know, if you think it's going to provide some value to you, then read it. Um, however, obviously, because we're talking about pen testing, I always recommend anything that's security or computer science related. Um, and then another great way is to get onto bug bounty platforms such as HackerOne and BugCrowd. Right, so these are places where you can sign up and use their platform to hack actual websites. And if you find bugs, you report these bugs to the companies. And that's a great way to actually learn in real time how to um, pen test a actual live website and to also understand what companies are looking for. So it allows you to assess and um, evolve your technical skill set in a real environment while also teaching you a little bit of the business side because you have to submit reports to the vendors. Um, and then programming. Programming is a big thing um, because it teaches you that analytical skill set, which you know falls in line with the pen testing mindset. Um, and there's plenty of books and free online resources that you can use for that. So now that we talked about how we can grow our network and our technical skill sets, right? We've, we've learned how to work with people 
and what we need to do with people. And we've learned about the technical side and how we need to grow our, our technical skill set. The next portion would be, okay, well, I want to start looking at um, jobs and start, you know, putting some feelers out there and seeing if I can get an interview or something. Um, however, then you might hit a roadblock or a speed bump or something, right? And they may, you, you may get back from HR saying, oh, I'm sorry, you know, um, we're going to be going with another candidate or something like that, right? And so these are some of the speed bumps that I see uh, individuals trying to get into pen testing and trying to hurdle over. So lack of experience in security programming or just anything that's technical, right? Those are going to be some of the big issues. And if you get that, then you need to backtrack a little bit and build up your technical skills a little better using the resources that we just talked about. Um, lacking certifications, right? A lot of times we want to get the big juicy certification and we don't realize that there's other smaller certifications that can help build up to that. And those smaller certifications will also help get us positions that will lead us into pen testing, right? Um, and we'll talk about that here in a couple slides. Um, However, you know, if you're starting out, don't go after the big certifications, right? Go after the smaller ones so that it can help build your career. And then lack of job openings, right? I'm from a small town in North Carolina where there is no pen testing jobs. And there's, I don't even know if there's any cybersecurity jobs. Um, I couldn't get a job there if I lived there. So, however, now I live in Seattle, Washington, and you know, there's more jobs than there are people. So, um, you know, you have to follow where your career is. And if that changes where you are geographically, then, you know, you that might be something that you have to do. And then a lack of motivation. Burnout is, very, is, is a very real thing in uh, the pen testing field because we're constantly engaged, we're constantly learning, we're constantly doing a lot of things. We're, you know, if you're a pen tester, are a very passionate cybersecurity individual, you're probably running and gunning 12 plus hours a day. And it's really easy to get caught up in all of that and not take a break and smell the roses. So make sure that when you develop your roadmap and when you are looking at ways of how to get where you want to, to where you're at and where you wanna be, that you make sure that you create a realistic timeline that allows for some buffer for you to relax. Because, you know, while it is it is a fun journey and it's really easy to get tied up into it, your body and your mind can only handle so much. So make sure that you take a break. So now that we understand some of the speed bumps, we understand how we can work with people to try to get into pen testing. And we've learned some different areas of where we can grow our technical experience without actually even being in the field. Let's talk about some positions that we can get before we even get into pen testing, right? Because if you're hiring, trying to get into pen testing and just keep getting, you know, um, deny letters back, then it's time to change your, your mindset and think about a different position that will eventually get you into the, the pen testing position that you desire. So as I started out in a help desk and then I went into firewall administration, right? So I went more into like networking sides of things, right? Those are positions that are gonna help push you forward. Right, and the help desk position is a great position to be in because it helps teach you a little bit about everything um, technical wise and how you know a system is set up within an enterprise. It also allows you to solve technical problems with people and, less, and, and a lot of those people may not be um, technically competent, right? So it, it teaches you how to solve these problems in a less technical way which is a great skill set to have. Um, so those are some positions that you can get. Uh, there's a bunch of different security specialist positions that you can get. Um, like I start, I was doing vulnerability management. I've done some information assurance stuff. Um, those are some good positions that you can get into. Um, there's SOC, um, just being a security engineer, working in the cloud, right? Though, these are all gonna be great positions that are going to be great to have on your resume if you're trying to get into pen testing. Another great way too is just to put yourself as an independent researcher working on um, bug bounty platforms or you know doing your own research and publishing it out there on GitHub and things like that. Um, and then another um, you know 
less IT, more uh, engineering roles, you can do software engineering or even secure software engineering, right? Where you're actually building programs. Those are going to be some great positions that are going to help pivot you into pen testing. So again, these are all great positions to have before getting into pen testing. And th these are going to be positions that if you can't get into pen testing, start looking at roles like this and, and growing from there. And then once we actually look at pen testing, right? So we looked at all the roles that can help us lead into pen testing. So what are some pen testing roles, right? Because you don't have to go on LinkedIn or Indeed and just type in penetration tester. These are some other roles that you can look at that actually do a lot of the offensive security pen testing kind of qualities, right? So of course there's the penetration tester, there's red teaming, right? You can be a red teamer, red team engineer. Um, those are gonna be the individuals that are off going and doing um, offensive security operations. And then there's offensive security engineers, right? And a lot of time I see that position title mingle with the, the word penetration tester. Application security engineers, where you're actually helping secure code and you're helping application engineers write better code and build better, better programs and better systems. Um, of course, there's ethical hacker. I still see that position pop up every so often. It's really just, you know, it's, it's a penetration tester with just a different word, right? So, but you may see that. Um, exploit developer. Right, you're gonna. That's gonna be the individual who's actually going to be um, hacking applications and developing exploit code. And then you can be a consultant, right? Um, you know, a lot of times smaller firms, you're just gonna be a consultant, and you'll do you you'll do penetration testing, you'll do vulnerability stuff, um, and anything in between, right? And then purple teamer. A purple teamer is someone who is going to be between the blue team and the red team, right? And so the key quality there is that they have to understand red teaming and pen testing and typically have a background in pen testing. Um, and so the great thing there is that, you know, this is a, the purple teamer is really a good position to have after you've done pen testing for a while. However, say, you know, you might be looking to spice up your life a little bit. Um, purple teaming is a, is a good position or a good job title rather to, to look at. So, so, now that we know how to how to network, we know the technical skills that we need to build up, and we also understand some of the job titles that we can get before we get into pen testing, and then understand some of the job titles that may have pen testing in them. Now we need to understand the educational requirements and then also the certification requirements. And some of this may come off a little biased. Um, I have a bachelor's degree and a master's degree and, and cur currently pursuing a PhD in cyber operations at the Dakota State University. So, uh, you know, I may present a little bit of bias here. Um, however, I do think that going to school for some is, um, is very good because it's something that requires you to push yourself, right? You have uh, you have assignments that have deadlines, things like that, right? So if education is something that you look at and is something that interests you, these are some of the, the um, degrees that you can get that are going to help put you in the right place to become a penetration tester. So computer science, cybersecurity, those are pretty obvious, right? Information systems, computer engineering, those are going to be some really good degrees to get if you want to go become a, a penetration tester or even do any of those positions that we mentioned to help get you into pen testing. Um, an MBA, especially if you want to eventually become management within um, you know, cyber operations and offensive security, an MBA is a, is a pretty good degree to have. However, I wouldn't recommend to get that um, you know, straight out of the gate, right? Um, coding boot camps are really good. Those are really good. Those are going to help secure you a job as a software engineer if that's something that you're interested in. Um, and then even criminal justice. You know, that's a I, I see a lot of individuals that have criminal justice degrees um, just because you understand the how rules work with culture. And that's a big part of being a pen tester is you have to understand the culture of your clients and your businesses um, and how that culture plays with security and how security plays with that culture. So in a lot of pen testing jobs that you see, you're going to see where it says, you know, a bachelor degree is typically required and a master's degree is typically desired. So, and what I mean by that is a lot of teams that I've worked on um, over the past few years, 
you know, a lot of the individuals, unless you have, you know, 20 years or 15 years of experience, you know, they would love for you to have a master's degree. And in the terms of creating a roadmap, having a master's degree is going to make you that more competitive, right? Um, and it's, it's just one of those things that's going to help kind of make you a unicorn a little bit. Um, you know, and, and I'm not saying go off and get multiple master's degrees, but at least having one is going to help you, right? And then down here, I, I also state like, hey, if you want to stay competitive, stay in school, right? Um, because it's just a great way to, to keep yourself in that learning mindset because you constantly have to have assignments due um, and things like that. So, so now let's talk about some certifications, right? So let me move my little window here. And so these are some of the certifications that we see um, to help get you into pen testing and also maintain yourself as a penetration tester. Um, there are some certifications that uh, are not on here. Um, however, I wanted to put some of the more entry level ones as, as well as the higher level ones um, that will help get you into pen testing. So I'm not gonna read this list right here because we're about to actually break them down, but we're gonna look at like, the cost of the the exam vouchers and, and how much time you're going to be spending on it. And also, um, for those of you on the outside looking in who may or may not be in cybersecurity at all or any or even a, have a technical background, I want to mention the um, how hard it might be to pass that exam without any kind of industry experience. So, so the CompTIA Security Plus, right? This is a great certification that's going to help build your knowledge base of just the security basics. Um, for those of you that go through like bachelor degrees too, there's a lot of material in most cybersecurity bachelor degrees that follow the security plus. So for those of you that are in school right now for cybersecurity, um, you know, do two things at once. And, and while you're going to school, also take the, the security plus, right? So how much is it? It's 350 bucks for a voucher and you're probably going to spend about $200 on extra materials. So that can be extra books, um, videos, uh, test books, things like that, right? Um, takes usually about one to three months of consistent studying. So I say consistent um, for this. That's probably about two hours a day. And then the exam is 90 minutes long. You have anywhere from... Uh, I, th I don't know the minimum amount of questions, but uh, as per the site, it says 90. So that's going to be the maximum amount of questions that you have. And you have to score a 750 on a, on a grade of 100 to 90. So uh, passing without industry experience. So this is for those of you looking looking in from the outside. Um, it's, it's not too challenging if you do proper studying, right? And that means you're going to be looking in your books and and testing yourself every day for at least two hours for one to three months. So what's the next certification? The next one is the Certified Ethical Hacker, also known as the CEH. This is an exam. It's not hands-on, but it is, as it says here, 125 questions. And those 125 questions test your knowledge of the of hacking methodologies so um, i've taken this and the security plus and this exam is a lot like the security plus only it applies hacker methodologies to it so the cost as you can see the voucher is pretty expensive twelve hundred dollars is not cheap <laughs> um, however this is a good certification to have because if you want to do compliance based pen testing you have to have at least ceh um, and there's other certs that you can have too, and we'll mention that, but CEH is the bare minimum if you want to do compliance-based pen testing. So how long does it take with, you know, consistent studying? Again, that's two hours or so a day, one to three months, um, would be expected. The exam is four hours long and you have to have a 60 to 85% to pass. And that depends on the exam that you give you. So I'm not sure quite how that works when I took this. Um, I th believe it just had a straight bar of what you had to have to pass. And I believe that was 70. However, they've changed it since then. Um, passing without industry experience, it's a little challenging because it's a lot of questions. However, you can do it um, if you do proper studying of you know two to three hours a day. 
and then less challenging if you pay two grand for the EC Council Prep course, which is a course that they provide for you, where it's a, I think it's like a week, and it's um, they teach you all the topics that are in the exam. So this is one of my favorite certifications out of the whole bunch. Um, this is the eLearn Security Junior Penetration Tester, right? I'm not even going to mention the voucher because you spend $500 and you get four exam vouchers plus lab time and all the materials you need to take the exam. Um, this is a great certification, especially now it's getting a lot of tread on becoming a, um, a really well-known cert in the industry, um, as opposed to three years ago when I took it, nobody knew what it was. Um, so it's a really good exam to take now. So, you know, you need about one to three months of consistent studying, and that's going to be reading the material, being in the labs and everything that they provide for you. And, and then the great thing about the exam is that it's 100% hands-on. It emulates a black box pen test, and you have to have a 70% to pass it. They give you um, a bunch of questions. I believe it's like 20 questions, if I remember correctly, um, that you have to answer by actually performing certain steps within the environment. Um, passing without industry experience, it's less challenging even from the outside looking in because eLearn Security really helps um, you know, hold your hand through the entire process of teaching you everything that you need to know to pass that exam with the materials they provide. Another great exam um, that recently has come to light in the past year or two is the Ethical Hacker Practical Exam. So let's look at the cost. It's 550 bucks for a voucher, and I would say you're probably going to spend 300 bucks on materials and extra labs and stuff. Um, again, one to three months of consistent studying of the two hours a day. And the great thing about this is it's like the the um, junior penetration testing cert from eLearn Security, this cert is a hands-on certification as well. It, they give you 20 questions that you have to answer based on what you can do in the environment that they provide you. However, it's not a it's not like a black box pen test. Um, they provide you a scope of machines that you have to attack and provide um, answers to the questions that they, they ask you. Now, from the outside looking in, this is a little bit more challenging um, because they don't really have a lot of materials out there. So you have to kind of go and um, look on your own. So it does, it, it makes it challenging that, uh, in that aspect because you have to go find the materials. So now we're going from, a, we went from two hands-on exams to a not hands-on exam. However, I would like to argue that this is actually a fairly challenging exam. The CompTIA Pentest Plus uh, is the, um, the pen testing cert provided by CompTIA. It's $359 for a voucher plus 300 bucks for uh, materials, videos, and some lab stuff that you're going to want to use to help practice your technical skill set to you know, carry over into the exam. The exam itself is uh, 165 minutes. It's a maximum of 85 questions. And just like the Security Plus, um, 750 on a scale of 100 to 900, you are going to have to do about three to four months of consistent studying. I would argue two to three hours a day. Um, it's just passing without industry experience is actually challenging. Um, and I took this exam last year, um, even after being in pen testing for a while, and I took this exam, and it was actually quite challenging. Um, you know, they provide a lot of really good scenario-based questions where you really have to go through a process of elimination to answer them based off of a scenario. So um, again, this is a really good certification to get, um, and it's fairly cheap, as you can see, right? It's, you know, 350 bucks for the voucher, give or take, and right, and 300 bucks for the material. So if you wanted to quarter that out in over the four months, you know, you're going to be spending a little over 150 bucks per month for the for the cert. So the next one is the GX Certified Penetration Tester, also commonly known as the G-Pen. That's um, provided by SANS. The cost, as you can see, the voucher is a whopping two grand. That's a pretty expensive voucher. Um, plus the training provided by SANS is, uh, you know, it's, two week, or it's one to two week training. Plus they have a net wars exercise where you and a bunch of other individuals go in and do a hacking challenge. Um, however, so that's, that's pretty expensive. As you can see, you could easily rack up nine to 10 grand to do it. However, this is a really good certification. It's another one of those certifications that is, um, I believe is required for compliance-based pen testing. 
So four months of consistent studying. Um, again, that's based off of the two hours plus a day. The exam itself is three hours. Uh, you have 82 to 115 questions, and you have to get a 75 to at least pass. So passing without industry experience, fairly challenging, right? Without um, any kind of industry experience. And then it says less challenging with studying and the efficient index. So the efficient index, what that means is that you're actually able to take your study materials and bring them in with you and use those as references to pass the exam. So when you're going through in the test center, because this is a, um, this isn't a, a, a hands-on certification, it's you go and take it in a test center and you can take your books with you. So create an index of crucial points that you may or may not, um, you know, be well, well diversed in so that you can reference those during the exam. So now we have the Certified Professional Penetration Tester, also known as the ECPPT. This is a eLearn Security Certification. The cost for it is 1600 bucks. That's with materials, labs, and an exam voucher. Again, they provide everything for you. Um, and then I would say two to four months of consistent studying, um, I would argue that Two hours may or may not be enough, um, just depending. And then the exam itself is seven days long. It's a actual real life pen test where they don't give you any questions or anything. They just give you a rule of engagement that tells you what you need to do. And then you go and do that over seven days. And then you have seven days after that to write a report and submit it to eLearn Security. So this is a really good certification for those of you that are looking to get some real life um, knowledge in how penetration testing works because this this really really uh, hits the nail on the head of, of how they do it. It's fantastic. Um, passing without industry experience, it's going to be challenging. However, because of how eLearn Security operates and how their certifications are, they they provide you everything you need to 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 pass the exam. So when you if this is a certification that you decide to get, they're really gonna you know, the material that they, they give you is really going to help you strive and achieve and pass, and pass the exam. So, and then we have the big cert that um, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of. It's the Offensive Security Certified Professional, also commonly known as the OSCP. The cost for this certification is 150 bucks for a voucher. However, um, on the initial purchase, when you're deciding to get the labs and the material and all that stuff, you're going to spend about 1350 you're going to get the exam voucher the materials and the labs and you only get the labs for 90 days um and then so and for a lot i hear a lot of individuals like to get an extension on the lab so that they have the labs for six months if you want to do that you're looking at another 800 dollars um however i would argue that you you might not need that there's other resources such as try hack me um Voln Hub, and um hack the box that you can use. However, I'm not saying you don't have to do the uh, the lab extension. If, if you feel that that would be, give you a good return on your investment while going through the journey of getting OSCP, then absolutely do it. However, I would baseline that this certification is probably gonna cost you about 350 bucks. Or I'm sorry, not 350. It's gonna cost you about 1500 bucks altogether. So how long does it take to get this? On average, and again, this is the, the rule, not the exception that I, I've, I've seen over the past few years, six months to, to a year, right? And I see individuals that get it done in less time and other individuals that it takes more time. However, the average is about six months to a year. Um, and that's with consistent studying. And you'll, you can read a lot of stories of individuals out there that studied, you know, for three, four, five, six hours a day, or, you know, completely lost their weekends because they spent the whole weekends or their whole weekend just, you know, studying for this exam. Um, so, and you can use additional resources such as Try Hack Me, Hack the Box, and Volt Hub, as I mentioned. So the exam, the exam is a 24-hour hands-on exercise where you get five machines in that vary in difficulty and points, and you have to, to hack those. Um, and then you have 24 hours to write a report after you've hacked, you know, however many machines you get into. So passing with out industry experience. This is a very, very challenging exam. It's a, it's a, it's a very sought after exam for, you know, good reason because it's so challenging. So, you know, 
when you're going after this exam, know that it is very challenging and you're going to hit a lot of roadblocks. You're going to hit a lot of speed bumps that you're going to have to work around. So, so those are the certifications that I recommend you look at in that order, right? Don't go straight after the OSCP. You know, look at some other certifications that are going to help build your career into pen testing. However, now that we've talked about, you know, degrees and certifications, let's talk about some of the skill sets that we need to develop as well. So programming, do you have to be a programmer to be a penetration tester? Absolutely not. I am not a, a, a programmer. I can, you know, do some scripting and things like that. And, but I'm not a, a software engineer or a programmer by any means. However, it is good to know how to script and automate you know, tools and, and things that you're using during a pen test. And one of the best languages to do that with is Python, right? If you're trying to think about a, a language to use for pen testing, Python is going to be the best one because it's used to write exploits. It's used to do, to do automation, to automate tasks, things like that, and to also um, write quick scripts to help you, again, automate tasks. Bash, same thing, scripting and automated, or I'm sorry, automation. And then I put C in Java because you'll notice a lot of exploits out there are written in C and Java. And you, um, especially with C, you'll learn how to compile and decompile um, exploits. So it's good to just know the basic understanding of C and Java. So other things that are good to be knowledgeable in are <clears throat> operating systems, Windows and Linux, right? We need to at least understand the basics of the, how the file systems work and the, and the basics of some of the commands that we're going to commonly be using, as well as networking, right? You need to be able to fire off um, ports and protocols without even having to reference anything. As, under, as well as understanding just how like TCP and IP stuff works, everything at like the network layer, right? And then software, just understanding the basics, again, how, you know, you compile and decompile software. Um, and then right now, cloud. Cloud is a great thing to, uh, to understand just even the basics. And if you have security knowledge in it, it's going to make you competitive. So, um, and I say that because cloud pen testing, especially in pen testing, um, there's not a traditional cloud framework that's been published yet. There's a lot of ideas and there's a lot of great resources out there on how to execute a cloud pen test. However, there's not a traditional framework set in stone yet. So if you decide to, um, you know, strive into cloud and, and focus on that area, it's going to make you um, a little bit competitive in, uh, in that aspect. And then now we need to talk about how do we, you know, maintain this um, this energy pushing us forward into pen testing, and then also once we're even in pen testing, right? So a big thing again, we talked about networking. Well, what are some other ways how we can network in a, in a less untraditional way, right? Um, join online hacking forums, Reddit, Discord, Slack, right? Those are really great resources to use that are going to help you uh, meet other people. Uh, create a blog and and publish any of your writings, whether they be technical or non-technical. Um, as I mentioned before, we need to continuously evaluate our technical skills using those platforms such as Hack the Box, Vuln Hub, things like that. You can use those and then create write-ups based off of things that you hacked on those and publish them on a blog. And then when you're applying somewhere, you can put your blog in your resume and have that as a reference point for the employer to look at and say, oh, this individual actually has, you know, their technical chops up to speed and, you know, they've created some really good content that shows that they're technically competent, right? And that's what, that's what's going to help give you a competitive edge is by able to, being able to publish these technical writings. So, and even non-technical, you can talk about ideas and talk about frameworks and things like that, right? It's all about just putting your name out there and not being afraid, right? And then subscribe to any of the hacking platforms. I put some of the cost on here. Vulnhub is free. Um, however, they did just uh, create a partnership with Offensive Security. So it's going to be awesome to see how those two companies move forward with the Vulnhub platform. Um, and then you have tryhackme.com, Hack the Box. Those are the subscriptions. And then you got Pentest Academy. It's um, those are going to be some really great resources that will allow you to continuously um, build your technical skill set as well 
has even in things like uh you know Vol or not I'm sorry not Vonehub but on Hack the Box there's a big community on Hack the Box where individuals talk to each other and everything. So again, there's another um, part where you can actually network. And then I say here, find find your niche, right? Find what you really really like. Um, I really like cloud and academia. I really like cloud because it's a continuously expanding technology and it's the hot topic right now. And there's a lot of areas for research as well as I like academia a lot. I really like giving back and I really like research. So when you work in academia, you get to continuously evaluate and um, renew your skill set and just your framework in your in your head. But, you know, there's some other areas, you know, rather it be system, network security, development. There's a, and, you know, these are just a few things, but there's so many areas of offensive security and pen testing that um, you can really, really dive into and go down the rabbit hole, so to speak. And the other big thing is too, is find a mentor. No matter where you're at, even once you become a penetration tester, make sure that you have mentors because those are gonna be the individuals that are gonna hold you accountable to, to keeping your goals, right? And find other student pen testers. This is a good thing, especially if you're wanting to be a pen tester. Rather, you're a student at school or you're just a self-taught pen tester. Find other, one, other ones that are just like you and see how they are in their journey and, and you can help each other out to get into pen testing. Then the other thing is too is find a mentee. Find someone that you can help, right? That you can help push their career where they want to go. And then also there's the bug bounty platforms. Those are great to have because those are going to give you a real world sense of how you can hack a live web application and also help you understand the business side of things because you're going to be producing vulnerability reports or pen vulnerability and pen testing reports that go to those organizations. And then to finish off, I wanted to talk about the challenges that we're seeing during the pandemic era, right? Because COVID is just, it's really thrown the whole world for a loop, right? So what's something big is remote work has become very, very popular, right? So, it's making things competitive. However, it's also opening things up for, for a lot of us, right? So make your online presence visible, right? Through social media, through Twitter, through LinkedIn, things like that. You can really, really use this time to shine on social media. <clears throat> Another big thing is hiring freezes. We're seeing a lot of companies just freeze all the hirings altogether. So what does that mean? That means you might not be able to go get that job with that certain company that you wanted to get to, right? Um, <clears throat> and we've seen this a lot right now, even with like interns, we've seen a lot of internships, you know, kind of go away because hiring freezes and all that stuff. So what can you do to work around this? Well, go look at, at those bug bounty programs, you know, see if you can build your skill set there and make a little money while you're doing it, right? And if you want to try another avenue, use your network, right? <clears throat> go on LinkedIn, go on Twitter, Facebook, anything where you may know someone who can help push your career where you want to go. And the other big thing is too, is the great, and, and I want to add, it's a great thing is that all these uh, conventions that we're having right now, they're, most of them are free and they're all online, right? And so, you know, use that to your advantage and use that as a platform where you can get your name out there. And again, it all falls in line with leaving fear in the rear view mirror and being humble. So, you know, make sure, just don't be scared. Don't be scared to talk to anyone and make sure that, you know, you're attentive and you listen and that, you know, you're eager to learn what, what they have to tell you. And then the other big thing is layoffs um, and furloughs. We've seen a lot of uh, individuals lose their jobs or have their jobs put on pause. So, and this, this goes more towards you is that if you've been laid off or you've been furloughed, use this time to reassess your skill set. You know, maybe set a milestone that that you didn't think you were going to have to set for a while. But COVID has, you know, COVID, COVID has no bias. So it, it if it has affected you, you know, use that time to better yourself, right? And it says go through steps one and two, you know, make your, your presence on, you know, your online presence on social media um, a lot bigger. And then also, you know, 
use your network, expand in your network, attend conferences, um, and look at other avenues of ways of how you can develop your skill set. Um, and another big thing too, and I didn't put it on here, is you know if you have a certification that you wanted to get for a while, I've seen a lot of individuals getting certifications currently. Um, use this time to spend a little money, get a certification or two, and then you know hit the uh, the workforce, you know heavy when um, things start to go back to normal. And then to close this out, you know, in your journey, you know, you're going to start out in your journey and you're going to have a lot of motivation. You're going to have a lot of energy and you may have some self-doubt, but your, your focus and your determination is drowning that out. And then you're going to have your, you're going to have your speed bumps and you're going to fail a little bit, but don't let that motivation stop. Don't let fear and doubt creep in just because you hit a speed bump and you fail a little bit here and there, right? Because you only completely fail when you, when you quit. So instead, take that time to learn what you did wrong. Take that time to learn how you can do better the next time and how you can grow. Because security is a journey. It's not a destination. So that's all I have for you guys. I appreciate everyone for coming to my talk. Again, my name is John Helmus, and if anyone has any questions for me, please feel free to reach out to me at my blog, or uh, I have a pretty heavy presence on LinkedIn. Um, so yeah, so again, thanks everybody, and I'll see you around.